Hello and welcome into the Free Outside Podcast. I was going to throw a uh, interview that I recently did and have a guest on today, but there's just like so much going. I thought I would do another solo cast. Is that what they call it? Solo cast? But anyways, we have Joe Stringbean McConaughey. I think that's how you say his last name. Everyone just calls him Stringbean, probably out of the fear of saying his last name wrong. But anyways, he's going for my unsupported record on the John Muir Trail. By the time you listen to this, it'll probably be determined whether he got it or not. And that trail is just so crazy because I think it's right at that limit. (laughs) Excuse me. Where it's like hard to figure out a sleep strategy. It's like a three-day record. I think it was three days, 47 minutes or something is the time I had. But it's really hard to figure out sleep. Like you can almost push on pretty much no sleep for 72 hours, but not quite. Like you just need a little bit of a of a, a hit of sleep, we'll call it, somewhere in that record. And he's also going southbound, which I did and he did in 2022. But the weird thing is southbound is the uphill direction. You start in Yosemite Valley, which is the lowest point, and you finish at Whitney Portal. The FKT ends at Whitney Portal instead of on Mount Whitney. But it's like net uphill by 4,000 feet or something. So we're both idiots going the wrong direction on that. So we'll see if he gets it. Um, Yeah, it's always sad when your records get broken, but they also are meant to be broken. Like when you set an FKT, you broke someone else's record. And for those wondering what FKT means, it means fastest known time. It's just like an ode to Maybe there's a time out there that is unknown that is faster. So we just call them FKTs, basically a trail record, which pretty much if you just think about like a hundred meter uh, dash, is that what they call it still? The hundred meter dash in the uh, Olympics, I guess it would be the same thing of like world record would be the fastest known time because maybe someone while getting chased by a saber tooth tire, tiger or tire, a saber tooth tire in 10,000 BC might have run faster than Noah Lyle. No, actually Usain Bolt has it. But anyways, we're getting sidetracked, but that's the whole point of this podcast. So that's about FKTs and yeah, sad to get broken, but you know, we've all broken each other's records for now some five years or something like me, Josh Perry, Joe have seemed to trade a few records out there. And so that's pretty fun (laughs) i guess we already hit on some olympics but i have had some funny olympic thoughts and i think this is the medium i am supposed to share them (laughs) first olympic thought why do swimmers get so many events like there there's backstroke breaststroke butterfly and then the standard style of swimming which is faster could you imagine if like on the track they're like Okay, we're doing the 100-meter dash as fast as you can go, and then we're doing the 100-meter skip as fast as you can skip. Then we're doing the 100-meter gallop, and then we're going to do all of those races for 400 meters, and then all of them for 1,500 meters. I don't know. I just think it's pretty weird in swimming. There's so many different strokes and styles of doing stuff when uh, it seems like you could just do swimming events that are like the fastest not the fastest to do it a certain way. So that's my uh, swimming hot take on this uh, podcast dedicated to foot travel. Obviously, I found something wrong with it. Who would have thought? Uh, My other funny Olympic observation is, you know, there's like horse stuff in this Olympics. Like they do the dressage thing and horse jumping and stuff. What if we just, I mean, since we don't really know whether to celebrate the riders or the horses, especially because the the horses usually have a name like one-legged buttercup or something really weird. What if we just did hobby horsing? So we just have people running around with those horses with, they have the head and it's on like a broom handle and you just gallop around to do horse jumping there or you dance with it like dressage. So that's uh, my recommendation. Another fun event, I just thought of this, I should do a race of this style so you know like last person standing if you don't it's basically where you start and say like 40 people start and you have to run one 4.1 mile loop 
in an hour. And then you start on the hour and do the exact same thing for 4.1 miles the next hour. And you keep going until only one person is left. And so why it's 4.1 is that equals out to 100 miles every 24 hours. But you have to run it in these segments of basically four miles every hour. And if you finish early, you can rest, you can sit down, you can eat. But you don't know how long it's going to last and you don't know um, how far you're going to go. And so it only ends when everyone except for one person has either timed out or quit. But I thought of a spin on this that they should put in the Olympics. Okay, let's just say it's 400 meters, or maybe it's a mile, or something like that. But you have like 100 people that start out. So let's call it, do a mile, because that'd be sweet. So you have 100 people that start out, and every single mile you finish, maybe you run this mile every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes or something. But whoever is last place is out. So if you have 100 runners, you go to 99 for mile two. So you know that you're going to be running 100 miles at the beginning, but you also know that you can't get last or you're out. So just think of this. Every like six or seven minutes, however long it takes people to come around, there's a sprint finish to keep their spot. This would be so cool if it just kept going. It's like a 100-mile race but you're having to like sprint finish continually. People would push their bodies so far. This event sounds pretty fun, and I think a, a looped course should have to do it. Speaking of looped courses, sign up for Montana Meltdown, October 12th and 13th. We have a 4-hour, a 12-hour, and a 24-hour. Why you should do fixed time races is you can push the envelope and do things like run 100 miles in 24 hours like pace the perfect way. You don't even have to carry anything. There's a aid station every mile and a half. I just ran the course three times actually yesterday to get some content and a course video. Uh, there were various things wrong with the video I took the first two times. So the third time was the charm on top of a uh, normal running workout. So we've hit on Olympics. We've hit on... Um, FKTs. Let's see how Joe does. That'll be cool. Oh, another FKT thing is uh, Tara Dower, who has the Colorado Trail FKT, has won a number of hundreds. She is going for the Appalachian Trail record southbound starting any day now. So if you're into watching that, it's going to be brutal. The Appalachian Trail actually has more elevation gain than the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail. And both of those other trails are hundreds of miles longer. So it's a steep and brutal trail. So that'll be fun to watch. Um, in other news, Buca de Beppo is going out of business, which sucks because I just love saying that name. And also, <laughs> this isn't just a random news story I pulled. I uh, went to outdoor retailer maybe 2016 or something, and this is the first time I really went out to dinner, networked with people, uh, kind of got to get to know the outdoor industry. But I remember we went there, and it was my only experience there, other than hearing Buca de Beppo, which, fun to say, uh, and like jokes and stuff. But I remember, so I showed up, my whole reasoning is I just, hmm. I don't know. Maybe I was looking for, yeah, I was looking for a job in the outdoor industry. I thought I needed to network, which obviously you do just if you guys need a shortcut or anything to level up your life network. Um, so went to outdoor retailer, hung out, met a lot of people actually have still used those connections today. So that's awesome. But then after one of the days they wanted to go out to dinner. So we end up at Book It Beppo. Love saying the name. And we all order various different items. And this is when it's like, oh, no, I have no money. When I went to Outdoor Retailer the first year, I slept in my car. I uh, pulled into a parking garage in Salt Lake City and slept in my car as my home to save money. I had no money at the time. Um, and so, Buca de Beppo, no money. Everyone orders. We're chatting away. But in the back of my head the whole time is like, Oh no, please don't make us split this bill. Especially as you see people just like offhandedly ordering more like breadsticks or more spaghetti. It's basically like Olive Garden, but 
when you're there, your family or something like that. But uh, yeah, I got to the end of the meal. And then luckily I was just so hopeful that one of the big wigs from uh, one of the outdoor brands would just throw down his card. And that's what happened. I was saved. I went back to my car, slept in it the next day before leaving the parking garage. I may or may not have pushed the entry thing for another ticket, so I only paid for an hour. Cannot confirm or deny that. That maybe did or did not happen. Depending on the statute of limitations, we were all really poor and gutting it out and just being frugal at some point in our lives, including me then. And in current life, I am just trying to figure out what to do. So I guess like the lesson or the meat of the episode is I was going to race this local 20, let's call it a 20 mile race with 6,000 feet of gain here across one of the ridgelines of the epic mountains here in Montana. But just mentally, I've been pretty drained since really since Cocodona, like putting together a pretty good gritty performance and just it's really hard once you push that deep into the well that was more of a mentally driven thing than physically because I had the limitation of an Achilles injury that I just pushed against and by making the decision that I can't take any breaks or I can only sleep 20 minutes over the excuse me I'm burping a lot I can only sleep 20 minutes over the 68 hours in order to perform how I want to perform It was just mentally draining to feel like I had to be on for all 68 of those hours that I just have not felt 100% mentally ready to enter back into that mile zero mindset, which is what I call it for the athletes I coach, is like going in ready to have a hard, good, big experience out there. And that's kind of been the thing. Um, Tahoe... It was going to be one of those try for the FKT, but can still have an adventure and hopefully run the entire loop. Did not work out that way. If you want to listen to my episode on, I think it's called Failing Epically. You could just uh, search that on your anywhere podcast or sold. Um, But yeah, I pulled out of this race. I actually talked about it in therapy today. It was a weird decision because... It's a race I'd wanted to do. I got into it the first time in 2020, and then it was canceled that year. And then I volunteered last year at it and then got kind of that automatic entry this year, but just have not felt into racing yet. And I'm trying to pull it together for Wasatch 100 in early September. Like mentally, I'm into moving, but I think it's just that to give everything. And Joe going for my record on the John Muir trail kind of reminded me of this mindset. Like there is that definite thing when you know a hundred percent in your soul that you're willing to dig extremely deep for something. And I totally felt that at Cocodona. It was kind of a shame to have an injury thing to work through, which wasn't very fun. I felt very ready for that mile zero mindset, knowing that I have to do one mile at a time, 250 times. It's pretty wild. But even for this 20 mile race that might be three or four hours, I just do not feel like I'm ready to dig very deep. I could show up, I could try hard, but it would not be the enjoyable thing that I'm, I would be doing. And I know that I would be showing up for the long reason, the, the long reasons, the wrong reasons. And so I just cut that off initially and just, uh, emailed the race director and, pulled myself out because I know I would get closer and closer to race day, which it would be when you're listening to this, it would be tomorrow. And I would show up there and just be pushing myself kind of against my will, which is a weird thing to say, but I would be wanting to do really well, but I would not be as mentally invested or interested in taking that top 10 to 20% and going for it. And if I want to do well at Wasatch, I don't think there's any way I can put myself into race scenarios or race mindsets in the next month. So pulled out of that. Sometimes you got it. Sometimes you don't. And just recognizing that and mental health and things like that and just taking things head on for what feels right and what you actually want to do, I think is pretty good. 
I've had this episode recorded for a while. It's I call it my backup episode if I'm ever not able to record or get something out there. And it's about quitting and kind of the benefits of it and not going for stuff. And I think that really applies here of, I don't know, I'm just not ready to show up my best self with the mindset that I want to do. And uh, so pulled out of it. There's always races in the future. I will be racing Wasatch at the beginning of September. And a ton of work mentally goes into some of these. Maybe some people are serial racers where they're able to just like channel it all the time. But I think coming from through hiking and FKTs, it's been really interesting of there's no linear, there's no linear approach. There's no set amount of time between things. It's just when you know, you know, like I finished the Arizona trail and was stoked. So, and just had the mindset, the like killer mindset for a while and it never dissipated. So I went after the Pinhoti trail FKT and got that right after the Arizona trail. So I finished the Arizona trail. Let's call it sometime in late April, maybe. And then I did the Pinhoti trail in mid May, just like a couple weeks off. And then I did the long trail in mid June or so, maybe late June. And in between that, I trained in the Sierra Nevada. So I just had this mindset that never waned. It felt like it was already at a hundred percent and everything. I mean, it was my life for like those three months and I was going after everything. It was pretty cool feeling, but it's one that I just haven't been able to harness as much, but the good thing is, I mean, back then my life was very one dimensional and it was going after records and races and, or not races, scratch that. We're going to have to delete that. Okay. Jamie, make sure to take that out of the episode. Just kidding. There's no Jamie here. I think, isn't that Joe Rogan's assistant? Just making fun of that. But back then it was very one dimensional of FKTs, FKTs, FKTs. I wrote a little bit for digital trends. I was working on a book, but everything was living as cheaply. I didn't own a car. I didn't really have any bills. I'd cashed out my retirement to bridge the gap because I knew I'd figure it out eventually. But back then it was one dimensional. And now I have the life I was aiming for back then of it's probably like one quadrillion dimensional where I have so many different things going and that's really rewarding because when one thing is lower or not working or something isn't happening on some front there's always this other side that is going like coaching is going really well i have i've had four athletes hit their race goals or achieve their fkts and or just like hit personal accomplishments in the last week and i have four or five more with no i think all I coach about 15 athletes right now, maybe, maybe a little more, um, but they all have stuff coming up. It's going really well. And so it's been just as enjoyable to root and coach on that stuff rather than feel like showing up at mile zero myself. It was funny the same week that I failed at the Tahoe FKT. I had an athlete do really well at Tushers hundred K and then also another athlete I coach set the record on the Oregon coast trail. We talked to him on here, Jameson. So it was pretty funny of just like, well, you don't get everything. And so that is long story short. Just kidding. That was long story long. Uh, the latest on not showing up for this race because I would just be showing up for the wrong reasons. So we're going to harness that and move forward and hit Wasatch hard. But ultra marathon training is so weird too. It's like, so many hours. Let's just look up right here now that I have my phone. Not that I ever didn't. But so last week I had 12 hours of training. The week before that was 18. This week will probably be around 18 to 20. And then in the past month, I've had a 19 hour week, a 24 hour week and a 25 hour week. That's how much time is going into training. This is both like weight training, running, um, heat training's not even on there. So you could add like an hour or two there, but it's just like all that on top of coaching, some writing that I think some of it's come out with outside and backpacker, all of that compiled just makes life so much different than, and even a relationship being a race director. Now all this just comes together to, uh, make it a much more multidimensional, but also rewarding life than before. 
In other news, um, Donnie T is actually coming to our town, lucky us. So that is pretty cool. We have uh, the Trump Meister himself. He's going to be uh, just kidding. It's not very cool. It's uh, pretty weird. There's actually merch stands like on every corner around town. And uh, so town is very busy. There's going to be Secret Service and it's probably going to be the greatest rally you've ever been to, especially since my ear got shut off. So, politics has made its way into the podcast. I apologize for that, but I just had to share this weird news that for some reason Donald Trump is going to be doing a rally in Bozeman, Montana. All right, moving on. And I don't think I've shared since uh, last week, so last Friday... I met up with some friends we call it Bozeman Beach. It's kind of more like a pond, but it is sandy. We were hanging out there, and this other uh, friend that we have told us that they were having a beer mile at their house in 30 minutes. So we debated for mm, five minutes and then decided we should go. But I had on Crocs, my two friends had on sandals, but I lived pretty close to this house. So we decided we're going to compete with the college kids in a beer mile. And if you don't know what a beer mile is, it is when you drink a full 12 ounce beer before every loop. So imagine a track and it, a track is a quarter mile. That means one quarter, one lap of the track is one quarter of the mile. And before every time you run that, you chug a 12 ounce beer. So we went to this uh, place to do the beer mile, and they had a course all picked out and everything. I ran by my house, grabbed two just old pairs of shoes laying around so that my friends could wear them. And so Sam and Devin were there, put on these shoes, and we just scrounged together a few beers. I w wasn't even planning on having any beers on this evening, but when a beer mile calls, and it's against college kids, you have to answer. So we show up and then people just start appearing out of nowhere. There's like 30 people doing this. So they go through the rules and everything. And then we start. So Sam, my friend's in my shoes, Devin's in my shoes, and I'm in Crocs. But we both get out hard. We, uh, all three of us, chug our beers and are out with the first of the college kids. Come around loop two, crap, crack that, crap that beer, crack that beer down it and then sprint another good quarter mile we have definitely distanced ourselves it's sam is running away with it he ran in college for wake forest and uh, devin had run a hundred mile or like a week before and i had done 80 miles of the tahoe rim trail a week before but we are dusting these kids so we're on our third beer and they're already throwing up in the grass we chug our third one run around even more of a gap. We come around our fourth one, fourth and final beer goes down. It's a little hard, but you know, it's just mostly burps after that. And kids are, I call them kids because they're like college kids. They're like 10 or 12 years younger than us. They're like throwing up in the grass. They cannot keep up. We down our last one and sprint around and Sam, my friend gets first in five, let's just call it like 545 or 550, five minutes, 50 seconds. Devin got like second in six minutes and 45 seconds. And for the beer mile, I got third in six, let's just call it 655, 650, somewhere around there. So pretty good showing for the old guys. We beat all the college kids. And uh, that is my beer mile story. And if you didn't know, now you know what a beer mile is. When you don't plan on drinking, but are at the beach and a beer mile calls, you answer. All right. Well, where should we go from here? I think, uh, so in therapy today, my therapist was like, we were talking about the Olympics a little bit and just like what was like, yeah, I think it's just really cool watching even the early rounds when people go for, I don't know, their race, they're in the Olympics for their race and maybe they do terribly, but I do not really care at all 
<laughs> actually i don't care if they fall i don't care if they do poorly i just think it's pretty cool that they all are out there and get to start and that i think i don't know it's hard to know how other people react but my therapist thought that was kind of interesting how i didn't really care about the result and just thought it was pretty cool to watch people's dreams of just like competing in the olympics because i think in my mind it's either like you win or you showed up and gave it your best shot like i don't really think i care that much about what's in between and the only way to win is for literally everything in your control and outside of your control to go perfectly. So I think I just put a lot less mm, value or weight into the winning portion because I think it's like pretty cool, but also it's a lot cooler that a lot of these athletes are just showing up. I'll tell you what, I've been getting into some pretty weird events like fencing and stuff. All right. I don't have a ton else today. I do take some notes once in a while. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess like there's uh, ast astronauts stuck in space. This is one of those podcasts that's kind of going everywhere, but astronauts are stuck in space. That that's kind of a weird thing. I don't know why I wrote that down as something to talk about on the podcast, but let's just try to riff on that. All right, imagine you're stuck in space, and they tell you you can't come home until maybe twenty twenty five. That'd be wild. What would you even do? I think I would like watch all the Harry Potter movies and then hmm, then I'd still have all the days left until I got home minus one. I'm not sure what I would do. Maybe learn a cool new skill. Maybe learn a language. That'd be what I'd do. Uh, shoot. I had one more thing I was going to talk about on here. What? What is it? Oh, well. Can't remember. Um, well, that is my... Uh, really unique podcast today talked about not i don't think you call it failing not showing up to a race uh my friend did ask if i had a ride or whatever to the race and that's when i told him i was not going but i've been pretty proud of myself for recognizing that would be pretty burned out and not into this whole hundred miler in four weeks if i did go and race so Pretty proud of myself for pulling out of it. And uh, on that note, I really don't know what else to say other than stay elite, my friends.